and avoidance of the Indian intellectual and cultural tradition that were central to the practices of Indian people. The academic world maintained a distance from its cultural heritage and looked down at it with suspicion. The colonial incursion was so powerful that although Western concepts were accepted and welcomed without scrutiny, indigenous concepts were denied entry into the academic discourse. Because the discipline was imitative, its growth remained always one step behind the developments in the donor country. Interesting. Now, if it is the case that this is what's happening abroad, does the same thing happen at home? Is it possible that we displace indigenous psychologies on our own home soil? What's the possibility that ethno-religious clients do not find psychotherapy speaks their language, meets their needs, or understands their religious heritage? Now, I use the word ethno-religious because I'm not talking simply about religion as a set of beliefs. And we tend to do that in modernist fashion. I like to think in terms of religious people, in varying degrees, of course, as parts of community, with sets of beliefs that interact with a grammar of emotions, with a web of, of rituals that give meaning to that community, and relationships that are generation upon generation. That's how I view ethnic communities. And for those of you who are Canadians, all we need to do around is look around in the, the greater, uh, in this, in the uh, lower mainland here, for the variety of ethnic groups. And one thing that I appreciate about my Canadian heritage is its commitment to multiculturalism, which I feel ve is very different when I move across the border with a kind of still implicit melting pot uh, model of ethnicity. Somehow we're going to become homogenous. And it, the Canadians have taken very seriously, partly by faith, partly because they had to, take seriously this diversity of cultures. And I feel sometimes it's more of a celebration of these cultures than it is tolerating cultures. And there's a big difference. Modernity asks for toleration. I think postmoderns want to celebrate differences. If that's the case, I want to include inside of that ethnicity religiosity. Not all ethnic groups are religious. But as some of my Asian friends have said, how could you possibly have a church meeting without the smell of home-cooked meals, uh, food coming from the kitchen? So that the culture and ethnicity all kind of go together. My own ethnic heritage is German, Ukrainian, mixed with a Mennonite heritage. And I have a low German language that goes with it. I have foods. There are ethnic last names. There are generations that have lived together. There are communities. All of that goes together for me, as opposed to simply doing a research study in which I ask people about their religious beliefs. Okay. That's the context of, of how I'm trying to look at psychotherapy, recognizing that society is diverse and not all religious groups are the same. Well, that was the centerfold, believe it or not, of Newsweek uh, in this past year. Uh, the U.S. president pointing upwards for faith-based services. I would wonder what that really means. Because American culture, especially U.S., not so sure about the Canadian, it's pretty similar, believes fundamentally in the separation of church and state. But what does that mean? Well, we have two people, two different sets of people who react to that question. On the one hand, we have Stephen Carter, a lawyer, uh, legal studies at Yale University, has argued that religious language in public has been trivialized. But he says, if you do that, you forget the fact that Martin Luther King's speeches were replete with religious allusions and had a profound impact on the civil rights movement. Do we really want to show, uh, clean, uh, scrape clean 
the public discourse of all religiosity? On the other hand, we have the philosopher Richard Rorty. He would argue religion has no place in public discourse following the Jeffersonian model. Religious language cannot be understood in the public square, so it's impolite. If you want to use your religious language, use it at home. But in the, in the public, what we will use is secular language. It's our shared language. Now, I've wondered what the implications might be for those two models in terms of psychotherapy. You see, I think clients have learned that therapy is a bit like a public place. And when they come into therapy, they don't talk religion. The therapist doesn't talk religion, so this must be a secular space. And so they present themselves. Therapy creates its own subjects, as it were, its own clients. And we do, we do therapy with clients who think and who are responding to what they think therapy is all about. If they are in a secular society, therapy occurs in that secular setting, then they function that way. They certainly wouldn't function that way in their synagogues or in their Sunday school classes or at their family reunions. They become a kind of a different person. Therapists also change. They've been trained. In therapy, we are objective, which means neutral, which means not, uh, kind of universal. That is, for us to be religious in psychotherapy, it's best done only privately. You keep your religi religiosity to yourself. We'll come back to that. However, if the therapist is silent about religiosity, the client may, may not use that language and, in fact, may feel invalidated. A religiously serious Sikh who comes to a Rogerian therapist or an object relations therapist who may not understand the language and wouldn't, may, might not create a context in which that language can be spoken, that client may feel invalidated, which seems a bit strange in the context of psychotherapy, it seems to me. Is there a relationship between the trivialization of religion public debate and its absence? I've just asked that question. I think that the ethno-religious citizen has the right to express his or her convictions in the public square. But likewise, the ethno-religious client has the right to expect that his or her religious culture will be deeply respected and integrated into the psychotherapeutic process not just tolerated, not just treated like a Saturday night ethnic and you're going to dabble in different kinds of foods. I think I'll have, I think I'll have some south of the border Mexican food tonight and I think I'll have some Asian food tomorrow. That's the Saturday night ethnic, okay? It's very shallow. You know a little bit about the tastes, but you know nothing about the history of the foods. And when, when psychotherapy functions in that mode, I neither find it uh, respectful, and I doubt whether it's really helpful. Now, I've suggested following Gandhi that what we need is a peaceable psychotherapy. We have the danger of imposing a common language in public. The danger of imposing a, co a common language in public parallels the danger of imposing an ideology of universality in the therapeutic relationship. Modernism reacted against fundamentalism and feudalism and hierarchy and dogmatism. Guess what? That's the traditional explanation, uh, description of religion. I want to say just a minute where there's an absence, where there's a vacuum in the culture, other dogmatisms fill their place. We still want something that's pretty fixed and universal. Modernity came up with its own universals. It's called the Enlightenment paradigm. It is a universal ideology, which then I think gets, gets 
imposed on clients. I'd like to say that that is an act of violence. There ought to be consent. A client ought to be said, ought to be told or could sign a consent form that the psych kind of psychotherapy I am now going to be receiving will be done in the context of modernity, an enlightenment paradigm which has several years, hundred years of history, and I submit myself to that kind of psychotherapy. And if they don't want to, they don't have to. However, modern enlightenment psychotherapies don't ask for consent. I wonder why not. By seeking universality, I think we implicitly impose an ideology. And I'm going to talk about it in terms of thinness and thickness. Give me a moment to explain those terms just a little, in a little while. Here's my alternative, however. I will probably not have time to go through the entire argument, but you're going to get the argument right here at the beginning. I'm going to break so we have some time for discussion in a little while. A peaceful term recognizes the particularity, the uniqueness of a client's ethnicity and religiosity. And I've connected those two. It begins with a therapist's confessed particularity whether as a modern or postmodern, as a religious person or not, uh, as ethnic or not. But I have a particularity, a uniqueness, an embodiedness, and that will affect clients. I'd like to, I'd hope it is peaceable because it recognizes these differences. It invites conversations that will then create a commonality it is not an assumed commonality. It's a commonality that emerges as a consequence of dialogue. And it moves from the particular and possibly to that which is universal. So this is kind of the structure of the argument. It's much more than one I can, that I can do in, in 35, 40 minutes. And I'm not even sure about some of the terms anymore. Um, I'm not sure whether imposing and empowering are quite the right terms. But on the one side, when religion is made private and we want to talk across all, all, all cultures, that's a thin discourse, and we assume what's referred to as an epistemological foundationalism, what tends to happen then is we have ethical minimalism, which is what you get in professional codes, and a thin psychotherapy. Those for me form a, are a kind of a coherent argument. The empowering model is one that is different. I've already argued for a religion that is in public, which is a more thick moral and cultural discourse, it tends not to be foundationalist, that is universalizing. It tends to assume a certain kind of ethical maximalism. It would be the difference between saying, uh, let's say Kant's uh, moral imperative, as opposed to, let's say, the Sermon on the Mount. Those are two very different ethical codes. And instead of a thin psychotherapy, which tries to do therapy with all kinds of clients, um, I'm suggesting, based on Alistair McIntyre's work, something referred to as a tradition-sensitive psychotherapy. Now, I could stop right there, and what I'm going to do now is just fill this in a little bit, and then let's have a conversation. I'll move through these pretty quickly. Thinness is a way of talking about universality. Okay? It's all contextual. It assumes the meaning of words are universal. It's all historical. We don't hear talk about then an American psychology or a Western psychology. It is psychology. And you're going to find this in, in ethically and philosophically and psychologically in people like Rawls, Kohlberg, and even and, and Freud. Thickness, and I'm borrowing these words, uh, these terms from Clifford Geertz, the anthropologist, um, in a marvelous book, now uh, a couple decades old, on interpretation of culture, 1973. Thickness is a commitment to particularity that's unique and historical. 
it's the difference between a person who says, I am an Hispanic, my parents come from Oaxaca, or Guadalajara, as opposed to somebody who says, I'm an American, I'm a Canadian, that's it, okay? Without even an awareness of where they, when they came over, or when, where they came from. Thickness is grounded in a community of linguistic distinctives. I grew up in a community in which we had three different languages going on at the same time. A, a borrowed language of the home, a, it was called Low German, and then there was the High German that was used in church, and then there was the English I was learning in school. And I might add, then there was another language I learned when I went to university. It was called psychologies, which my mother didn't understand at all. Here the reps are people like Stephen Carter, Michael Walzer, Michael Sandel, Hauerwas, Wittgenstein, Alistair McIntyre, and Carl Jung, in various ways, Jung. Now here's the dilemma. If therapy is thin, that is universal, and now we're talking of empirically validated treatment techniques, then presumably there's very little danger of imposing it. It's common to everyone, it works. However, if therapy is thick, historically particular, cult cultural in nature, it's more limited in scope. I would now be able to do therapy only with a Hindu, or because my therapy, let's say, is uniquely suited for a person who is Hindu, or Buddhist, or Islamic, or Adventist. So now the scope is narrower. But if I'm not one of these groups, the possibility of my imposition goes up, which is the standard critique of religious psychotherapists. psychotherapists. They will impose their values. I want to suggest that a peaceable psychotherapy is one in which begins with differences, moves with dialogue, and communicates from within the client's religious, linguistic, and cultural world. That to me is more peaceable. Uh, Jung, in fact, said that when he went into therapy, he had to set aside all theory. Whether he did or not is another question. But that's similar to this in the sense in which one begins with the grammar and vocabulary that a client brings in. And religious clients have a unique vocabulary, at least. But it's more than that. That vocabulary shapes the structure, the nosology of pathology. What's sick in a particular culture is in part defined by the language that they use. But, but it's more than that. There's also a grammar of emotions. It's not just a listing of the 16 PF. That's assumed to be universal. Wittgenstein argued that there is a language and even, and others have extended it, to suggest that unique to a particular ethnic group is a grammar and syntax as to appropriate emotions for, appropriate, for particular situations. Oh my goodness, that makes therapy incredibly complex. How could I ever do therapy with someone who comes from a culture other than my own? Well, that's a good question to ask. What makes me think that I can? Maybe I can't. It's at least worth asking the question whether men ought to be doing therapy with women or a fundamentalist Christian therapist working with a Unitarian uh, religious, a person of a Unitarian uh, persuasion. It's a possibility they do not understand each other. Understand at all of these multiple levels. And there's the danger of violence. Now, in order to understand the argument that I had on the left-hand side, we have to do a little bit of, of history. We have to go back to the wars of uh, the Thirty Years' War, in which almost half of Europe was killed. Can you imagine that? Half of a continent 
were, uh, uh, people were killed in these religious wars from 1618 to 1648. Descartes lived during that era. If you have that kind of violence going on, the question begins to emerge, now, if that divides us, what would bring us together? Well, it won't be religion. So then you have to move some, to something that is non-religious. And that, for Descartes, was reason, based on the fact that what we all would have in common is the possibility of doubt. The cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. That now, that rationality, could become the platform, the basis, the foundation of knowledge, politics, the structure of society, morality. Stephen Toulman, whom I highly recommend to you in his book Cosmopolis, suggests that in that era, we move from oral to written communication, from the particular to the universal, from the local to the general, from the timely to the timeless. So that the knowledge base then, eventually, of psychology is in this, uh, cast in this hue, with this texture. Descartes wanted a sure foundation, and it wasn't religion. That way we wouldn't have to deal with the dogmatism and the authority of religious folks. We would have overarching principles of freedom, justice, and responsibility. Knowledge was now abstract, general, universal, and timeless. Context of knowledge was irrelevant. This kind of knowledge, uh, Alistair McIntyre has referred to in his book, Three Moral Versions uh, of Inquiry, as the encyclopedic tradition. And he uses the, Brit the Britannica, um, ninth edition, as the model of, uh, as of the encyclopedic model of knowledge, where knowledge is in bite-sized pieces, it's based on science, it's assumed to be common to everyone. Ethnicity is irrelevant. And it's profoundly secular. And one methodology describes it all. Science is now applied to every conceivable topic, whether it's sexuality or religion or ethnicity or politics. I think of it sometimes as the cheese whiz model of knowledge. Everything's homogeneous. You can squeeze it out of the tube and it's consistent all the way through. I think that what we need is a different way of looking at knowledge that's non-foundationalist, that respects differences, that's based on a conversational exchange. Um, and it doesn't begin with a preordained script which is exactly the opposite of what, what I've just been talking about. I mentioned that. Moving along that model on the left-hand side, I'm now to the part of thinking of ethical minimalism and, uh, and the role of morality and values and religion in psychotherapy, particularly morality. If psychotherapy is contextualized within culture and therapy is a way of socializing people into a culture, I think of psychotherapy as a profoundly moral process. I don't see it as neutral. What moral culture would psycho psycho psychotherapy be socializing the individual into? Well, Walser has suggested that there's something that he refers to as a thin morality. He says he was watching uh, the television and he saw marchers in Prague with placards calling for justice. You see the word justice and you assume you know what they're talking about, he says. Well, what would it mean? Well, the end of arbitrary arrests, for example. Okay. But he says that's an example of where morality cuts across all of the cultures. And you could talk about it at that level. But that for him is still a thin 
form of morality. The code of ethics of professional organizations are thin in the sense in which they're a moral average. It's what you can, it's what, when you get all the professionals together, that's the least common denominator. Okay? It's not, ethical codes don't ask you to sacrifice for your clients. They just say, don't have sex with your clients. Don't defraud your clients, etc., etc. It's a minimalist ethic. It's what one could still agree on. My sense is that modern psychotherapies have moved towards this kind of a thin approach. You see it in Freud's generalizations. Um, you see it in cog, cog B, cognitive behaviorism. You see it also sometimes in existentialism. It's an attempt to define meaning in broad, with, with broad strokes. Very interestingly, when you look at Freud, um, David Bacon, writing in Canada, University of Toronto in the 70s and 80s, talked about Freud as a Jew who had become secular, who'd gone public and general. And he could still, by scratching the surface, still find some Judaism underneath Freud's thinking. Now that's fascinating. For me that's fascinating. That is in the modern era, when you want to sell your psychology, you have to universalize it and leave behind your ethnicity. You have to translate it, as it were. Same case can be made for Jung, leaving behind his reformed heritage, and Rogers, his mainline Protestant roots in the 30s and 40s. Now, if we apply this encyclopedic model of uh, psychotherapy, the point is neutrality and objectivity. I'm going to skip ahead, if I may. Morality in this context is has more to do with rules. If you uh, remember your ethics courses, um, legal and ethical issues has to do with applying moral principles to psychotherapy. That's precisely what I'm talking about as a thin form of of morality. Now this is the whole second half and I'm going to go through it pretty quickly even though this is the, the heart of the argument. I'm arguing for a thick discourse, non-foundationalism, <coughs> the appropriate place of ethical maximalism. That is, if a client comes to you with the Bhagavad Gita as a part of their heritage or the Tao or the Christian scriptures or the Quran, and that's, that's their chart of who they are, then therapy has to take that seriously somehow. And my argument is that you hold people accountable to the charter that they have said what they want to have shaped their lives, not what I want to have shaped their lives. Because I was reading this morning The Prayers of Gandhi, it's one of the books on sale here, and I was just fascinated that while he would call for a certain ecumenicity, his prayers were highly particular. They emerged out of his own religious commitments, which profoundly shaped his, his, his commitment to nonviolence and a pursuit of further truth. That I refer to as ethical maximalism. So, let me continue. It would be really strange if I argued for the imposition of religion psychotherapy as a person who is committed to the Anabaptist religious tradition because the Anabaptists were persecuted in the 16th century because they wanted religious freedom. For me then to impose it would be completely contrary to were my own religious principles. Um, Constantinianism is a way of applying one's religious principles to everybody, even baptizing them against their will. My tradition disagrees with that. Thick descriptions of religiosity, that was by way of preparation uh, background, Thick descriptions of communities are rich with cultural illusions, are symbolically complex, 
and often, not always, ethically maximalist. Now, as opposed to assuming that what we know is universal, I follow Wittgenstein's notion that we learn our meanings for words in the context of communities. To be sure, we go to school and learn broad meanings. But if our communities are very important to us, they have local meanings. Uh, Mr. Gandhi mentioned yesterday that um, Mahatma Gandhi didn't find the right word for pursuit of truth. So he used satyagraha, if I pronounced that correctly. That word just captured something he couldn't find elsewhere. Yes, that's the point. And just because we can mispronounce the word or have someone explain to it, doesn't mean that we know what the word means. Words take on their meaning depending on the context in which they're used. In a religious setting, <clears throat> the language of the self is very different than when you use it, let's say, with Kohat or the object relations theorists. But the word's the same, so it must have common meanings. No, I don't think so. And that's the part that gets lost. We tend to assume that the words mean the same thing. That's why we have to listen to the client to find out what this word means to them, not what I think the word means. Um, strongly recommend uh, Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations for an understanding of this, this larger argument. Um, McIntyre has argued that what we need is an, a recovery of the importance of tradition. Hence what I'm referring to as a tradition-sensitive psychotherapy. He's building it on Wittgenstein's notion that language and culture shape meaning. And that what we must do is not critique traditions from the outside. That's the modernist model. There may be practices that a religious community engages in that I don't agree with. They're, they may advocate a hierarchical relationship between male and female. Now, wouldn't it be simple for me to simply say, aha, oppression? Yes, but just a minute. That's assuming a universal understanding of what that word means. It might be oppression, but I'd still have to figure out the nature of those relationships and their explanation for those relationships from inside of the culture. And if they're going to change, I'd rather encourage them to change from that which is consistent with what they already know inside their tradition, rather than because I am going to use enlightenment moral principles to tell them this oppression, this is oppression. I consider that an act of oppression. I'd much rather have them work it through in terms of their religious heritage. My task is to find out where the resources are in their own heritage that might encourage them to move to, more, to greater consistency. I find it so interesting that there's so little conversation in the US about where in the Islamic tradition there is a commitment to peace. We just go out there and bomb the hell out of them. As opposed to asking, what, what in their own, who within their own tradition would say that's inconsistent with who we are? And we assume that it is our moral duty to impose our moral law on someone else. I'm, I'm troubled by that. Walters argued that what's important for people of Prague when they're holding up those placards is that in the end they must decide in their own legislative system how justice works itself out in the welfare system. Not sure that the American model of how you do just distribution of goods would be appropriate over there. That's local. That's very thick. It's an example of thick morality. <coughs> Traditional sense of psychotherapy begins with difference, the client's particularity. 
doesn't claim a transcendent position that permits assessment of normality independent of conversation. The goal of therapy becomes the enrichment of the client's tradition rather than position of the client's particular, the, the clinician's particularity. Well, let me stop there. There are other things in here that might might help for a conversation, but I'd be much more interested at this point hearing from you in terms of what your thoughts are in interaction. Yes? I could agree more. Um, there I think Jung was right that to understand one's client one would have to understand the cultural background. I have a harder time with his, his kind of Kantian universals and then applying those in terms of the archetypes on the clients. But the notion that we would need to understand the cultural, historical, religious context of clients, yes. Yes. Okay. And the reason is, it seems to me that there's something quite, even if there were two interpenetrating, certainly in other eras where, where each culture, each were enclave was defined by its religion as well as its ethnicity, and they were identical. I think that's a specific problematic at the contemporary age. We've separated those things because we know of plurality. That raises a major question. Yes. Yes, I understand it would. It, it sounds to me like everybody would have to be a pastoral counselor, or else you couldn't be a counselor. Uh, but let me pursue this. Yeah. Uh, the difference in religion compared to ethnicity is that religion includes not just things that have to do with this world and living and how people get along, but they all project some other worldly ground that makes the coherence in this world event. Except that all the other worldly positions they tend to differ from one another. Right. And the issues are unresolvable because they can't appeal to empirical evidence to resolve those differences. So the only way to approach them is you have to accept them as such. And so God is three, God is one, there is no God, God is everything, and people build their lives around that. Right. And there's no way of resolving those questions. They're like opinions. Everyone has one. Even the rest of the uh, society is like something else. Everyone's got one. Uh, and so I'm in therapy with somebody who's, uh, I'm thinking they're September 11th. And I would like to know how you are going to justify, I have to accept everyone's religious beliefs and work within their system and work with them on the basis of their specific beliefs when I know, and of course I shouldn't know, of course, we're not allowed to have any objective knowledge, we're not allowed to have any science. You know, all that notion of trying to come to what, I mean, you're using a machine there that depends on the outcomes of Descartes and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. And so we're just going to write all that stuff up. Confusing science with therapy, theory with practice. Anyone who knows practice knows you can take the theory and apply it. And then all that you say, of course, comes into it. Any good therapist would do that. Mm -hmm. But to write off science as a result, because therapy has to be specific, seems to go quite well. What do you do with the bomber who's going to fly their plane into a couple buildings because Allah needs to be praised? But the fact of the matter is, some beliefs are destructive. Granted. And as psychologists, we know that. My code of ethics requires me to do what's best for my client. Mm -hmm. Now, what do I do when I know, with all the professional skills I have in training, that the problem is specifically the beliefs the person's dealing with and living with? 
Mm-hmm. On the basis of this openness to every every particularity, I just see absolute division of all society into little yeah. fragmented parts. Yes. Uh, and go back to religious waters. Uh, I think that is where we are. We are fragmented. Okay, for starters, we are fragmented. Okay, uh, you were hinting at one though, uh, a couple times. One is that there's something in our professional expertise that could respond to that situation, and once you hinted at the notion of science as that which be common to all of them, on the basis of which you could respond. Now, how would you do that? How would you respond to the to the bomber? based on professional expertise or on the basis of science? That was the question I asked you. <laughs> no, because you, I've already indicated that I'm not going to go the universal road of science. And I'm saying that you have no answer. I don't oh, oh. Uh, I, I'd be glad to respond. Um, and I think I already did. Um, Uh, and then, granted, well, it's a limited model. Because if it's a violent model, what are the options? What options do I then have? Let's say it is a, you know, Jamesian sick religion. Will I then impose a healthy one on them? Really? Huh. And I know what and I know what health is. Yeah, and I know what health is. Let me get a couple of responses. Uh, let's see if we can keep the conversation going. Would you like to respond to this or the ongoing? Let me get any others that want to respond to this particular conversation. I, mean, I want to respond to the conversation. Because you said, I brought people from culture, I brought them back to America. And I live in this culture of Muslim Americans. And I think that the whole thing is 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 that the so, I mean, I'm not a Muslim, so I can't speak to the Muslim religion. I don't know much about this. But I can speak to the fact that the, in the culture that I grew up, there are things that are definitely wrong, and there are people who can speak to values to go beyond what I think is definitely, not definitely wrong, but such things as killing or deals are bad, not everybody's fanatic and so on. So, I think I heard you say, and I'm actually kind of going to something that you said that I thought was possible. There's something that what you do when you are in relationship to another culture or another religious tradition is to act in a way kind of like someone who's open to the fact that there are solutions within their cultures as well. Right. And not totally as someone who's but I also agree with what you're saying to certain extent, that that doesn't mean if I accept all behaviors that are important. And one example for me is the as an activist where the um, That's right. you know. So I think there's a middle ground to the things that you're saying. And what you're saying that I thought was really possible is that when I work with somebody from another culture, I don't assume that I know, but I also assume, and if they can express my assumption, that there are other solutions that are not destructive and painful to people within that culture. And I hear Muslims all the time giving different voices. Some Muslims don't believe that crashing the elements mm-hmm. of the mm-hmm. You know? I don't know if this, is, this makes sense. This is the world. Some 
No, you're not. I, I do think, personally, I do believe that, that both are true. Um, and I, the way we have our own grass is not how it's set right now. Okay, let me now shift. We've got maybe one or two more. It's at Roma. It's already 5 2. Go ahead. Is there anyone else? Yes, over here. So this doesn't have to do with it. Okay. I just have a question in terms of, um, at the beginning you were saying that uh, people from the community are sort of questioning, should you go to the ethnic group also with their group? Right. And I'm just wondering, what I'm finding in my research with um, uh, Portuguese uh, therapists uh, is that a lot of times once they can their training, uh, they're, um, they are um, sort of indoctrinated because um, those are North American theory do carry out uh, there. So whether they were trained in America or in Portugal, they uh, often do hold uh, the notion of universalism and, and, and not <coughs> want their clients to use both idioms, for example, and, and do say that all the therapies work with uh, Portuguese immigrants, uh, no problem. So it's interesting that we sort of make an assumption that because they're from that ethnic that it applies, but I think sometimes that can, um, because there's that match, there's no receptivity as to whether there are differences in the Right, yeah. I didn't hear a question. I'm, I agree. Yeah, no, I'm just wondering That's fine. If you I just, I couldn't agree more just in terms of uh, the way in which I've laid out the theory, you know, the, the, the socialization of the therapist, the ways in which the client is socialized for certain kinds of psychotherapy and then it seems to match, you know. I think we better stop. Just in terms of the time, just in terms of the time.
speak to that. We have nurse next to us. There's no other means to bring at this point. Just call us if you want to call us an official stop and then all the conversations continue if you're still available. Sure. And even if this room is available, you can use conversations in the cloud as well. Okay. I leave it here. I have a conversation with my wife that's Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you were with the center. Yeah, I'm just for Yes, yes, I know. Of course. Oh, of course. Oh, yes. Victor Adrian was one of my first teachers. And he was a past president then. Yeah.